Yeah, I mean, the pilot's not coming back there to deal with, like, rowdy Peter. Like, ch -ch -ch, sit the f*** down. No more wine for you, Peter. The pilot comes over the intercom and says there's fog or technical difficulties, but what's actually going on in the cockpit? What does he really mean when he says fog that should have you concerns? Or just how bad are those technical difficulties? Ladies and gentlemen, everything is absolutely fine. There are no problems. The mic switches off. Oh my god, Jeff! The engines! They're f***ed, Jeff! <laughs> oh, poop. So like, please remain calm, ladies and gentlemen. It appears that all four of our engines are uh, currently out of service. We're doing our best to get you comfortably to the ground. <laughs> Pilots are chill. Pilots are chill. They're like, tense situations. And like, those cockpit voice recorders, where it's like, you know, moments before impact or whatever, and it's like, hmm, this looks bad. <laughs> Now. Today we'll look at things that the airline industry doesn't want you to know, especially one about guns on planes. Don't say that. How many guns are on planes? So let's go. Whilst traveling by air is certainly the most convenient way of getting around, it does put you in a somewhat unique position. Once the doors are closed on that de disease infested metal tube, your life is in the hands of two people. And if something should happen to them, then you're pretty much screwed. Surely they'd just be like, does anyone know how to fly this plane? There's like 300 people. Some would be like, yes, yes, actually, I know. <laughs> is there a doctor on board? <laughs> it's like, I was on a flight the other day and I heard that. that someone gave everything into comments like, is anyone a doctor, please? <laughs> it's like, I don't know what happened. I was just, it was fine there. I just don't know what's going on. But uh, if someone, if they come over and go, just happens to be a pilot on board. You'd be like, what the f why do you need a pilot? Whilst in the movies, one of the passengers would remember that they are, in fact, a fully qualified airline pilot and will save the day at the last minute. In reality, this very rarely happens. In order to ensure the passengers remain calm and don't think too much about the fact that they're traveling in an unsupported vehicle a mile above the ground, airlines tend to keep certain pieces of information on a strictly need-to-know basis. So, in tabloid fashion, let's see if we can't make your next flight slightly more terrifying. Oh no, I'm going on a flight in like a week. <laughs> No, don't. The one I the one I know about airlines is like it's gross. Like shit is gross. Like they test the like for bugs and stuff. Like the air is fine because that's getting pumped out like every two minutes and new air's coming in. It's not like recycled because they just bring it in from the outside, condense it, and then put it in. So it's actually like it's very dry, but it's not disease infested. But that like tray table, the like bits down the side, it that's just I try not to touch on the plane. I'm always just like this <laughs> just don't touch anything hello everybody have you ever found yourself in the age-old dilemma boxes too loose briefs too tight well worry no more because today's sponsor sheath have got your back or should i say not your back but your nether regions. I'm currently wearing sheath right now. I've also got a nice clean pair of sheath right here and it's incredible. No more discomfort, no more awkward adjustments, just pure comfort. Whether it's hot outside, cold outside, whether you're in the gym, whether you're just sitting at a desk, no one likes the underwear that's like moving around and getting all uncomfortable, like riding up or, you know, it's not right. None of that with sheath, which keeps everything exactly where it's supposed to be. They have this dual pouch system, so your uh, different man bits can go in different sections, which keeps everything, like, especially in the summer, this is really good. Way less sweaty. Very nice. But I was skeptical at first. Who wouldn't be? Why? <laughs> you put your different pieces in different pe places? Bit weird. Try sheath, get one bare, you'll see what it's about, and then your entire underworld drawer will now be filled with sheath, like, in no time at all. It's just how it works. That's mine. It's just only sheath now. If you don't feel like wearing the, using the dual pouch system that day, no problem. You don't have to. They're still extremely comfortable. Plus, they have base layers for the winter. They've even got a brand new women's line, which is cool, made out of bamboo. Plus, Sheath are now the official underwear sponsors of the UFC. Head over to sheathunderwear.com and treat yourself. Use the promo code BLAZE for an exclusive 20% off. That's sheathunderwear.com. Promo code BLAZE. Your nether regions will thank you. And now back to today's video. Flight attendants know how to handle themselves. Flying can be stressful, and it's not unheard of for that stress to result in unnecessary belligerence from customers. However, if next time you're on a flight you suspect that you have been served decaf coffee rather than the real stuff, it may be unwise to get too aggressive with your flight attendant. According to CNN, violent passengers are on the rise and airlines are taking steps to train their staffs appropriately. Yeah, people have like air rage, right, where you just get rage. And I never understood this until I realized, oh, I, sometimes I get rage. You know when you're at your computer and it's like, oh, for f sake, close the program! 
And it's like that irrational rage. There's no reason to be shouting at the computer. It's just making a little error. It's got like its own little brain fart going on. But you're like, what the f-? But apparently some people get that on planes. I'm glad I just get it in my quiet office. If I was surrounded by Billy in the office, I'd just be like... And give myself a stroke. While some of the training simply focuses on de-escalation techniques, they are not holding back on teaching people what to do if that doesn't work. According to the same article, part of the training teaches cabin staff how to strike, stomp, and subdue a violent attacker. Piss off! And that's just for people who have had too much alcohol and decide that it would be funny to try and open an emergency exit. You, you can't open those emergency exits in the air, though, can you? <laughs> it's nice I was going to go up there and be like, Hey! Right? Right? <laughs> For dealing with an attempt to hijack the plane, there's an even more brutal section of this training course. Skills in this section include, but are not limited to, using anything you might have at hand as an effective weapon and learning the most efficient way to eye-gouge your opponents. So, why do airlines not necessarily want you to know that your innocent-looking flight attendant could hand you your ass without even trying? I mean, surely that would help keep violent attacks. Uh, I mean, surely that would help keep violent attacks down, right? Well, that's what I thought. That is until I spoke to a pilot friend of mine. Jack is a fighter pilot, but sick. Sick. That is one of the coolest jobs. Like, if you introduce yourself to someone, it's like, what do you do? Like, rocket scientist, brain surgeon fighter pilot. <laughs> but in his words, he knows several mundane pilots. <laughs> this is what they said when he asked them the same question. Basically, it mostly boils down to alcohol. Those drinkers who insist on ruining it for the rest of us by turning into rocky wannabes after a can of wine or a paper cup filled with vodka and coke have, in the past, decided that it'd be fun to test their skills against the alleged skills of flight attendants. What's wrong with these people? Yes! What's wrong with people? While this invariably ends up badly for the customer, a physical disturbance disturbance can be distressing for other passengers. As I said, I do not personally know if this explanation is correct, but I am more than happy to take Jack's word for it, purely on the grounds that he is a pilot and I am not. Of course, you are all free to make up your own mind on the validity of this claim, but it makes sense to me. Dave, I still can't get over how cool it is that your mates are fighter pilots. It's f***ing cool. Some Top Gun. I just saw that the new Top Gun movie is on Netflix. No. Or is it Apple TV? One of these. It's on there and I'm very excited to watch it again. Planes are often low on fuel. Before I started researching this script, it never even occurred to me that a plane I was on might run out of fuel. I mean, I was obviously aware that aircraft require fuel and that fuel tanks were not unlimited with regards to capacity, but the idea that my airline of choice might be genuinely so abstemious. Woo, fancy word, Dave. <laughs> I don't know what abstemious means. Never even heard abstemious. Absteminy. Abstemious. Abstemious. There might not even be enough fuel on board to get you to your destination. Never even occurred to me how wrong I was. Obviously, that was a bit misleading. Planes are not regularly falling out of the sky because operators only included half the fuel necessary to make it across the Atlantic. That would be pretty bad for business. The problem is that airlines often only fill up with exactly enough fuel for the journey, plus an extra 45 minutes, which is the minimum allowed by FAA regulations. Which makes sense, because most things work perfectly. And if you're like, if there's, if you have 45 minutes of extra fuel and you're running out of fuel, they're going to let you land. You're going to be like, yeah, run out of fuel. And they'll be like, okay, we'll clear a path. And if you get down to like five minutes, uh, assuming you declare a May Day and anyone will let you land. If you look at this from a financial point of view, it makes perfect sense. The heavier the plane is, the more fuel is used up on any given journey. Vast quantities of airplane fuel are very heavy, so it makes sense not to overburden the craft with unnecessary weight. The problem seems to start if, for whatever reason, the journey does not proceed exactly to plan. According to an anonymous captain from a major US airline, quote, I'm constantly under pressure to carry less fuel than I'm comfortable with. Airlines are always looking at the bottom line, and you burn fuel carrying fuel. Sometimes if you carry just enough fuel and you get thunderstorm or delays, then suddenly you're running out of gas and you've got to go to an alternate airport. Now, I'm by no means an expert on this stuff. My main expertise lies in making sarcastic comments about stuff like this. But I would imagine that having to reroute to a different airport because you ran out of fuel, compensating passengers for the inconvenience, paying staff overtime, etc., would cost considerably more than topping up the planes a little bit before they leave. Well, Yes, but they've obviously ran the numbers, and if that does happen, it would obviously make more sense to carry more fuel. But on the whole basis of things, that happens so rarely that it doesn't make sense to carry more fuel. And honestly, like, planes aren't dropping out of the sky because they run out of fuel. Although that was that, was that, there was that famous case in that incredible black box thinking, 
I think it was from this book, where there's a plane, like, I think it's a Colombian plane or whatever, and they're trying to land at JFK or something like that. And the Colombian culture, I think it was Colombia, like South America, is much more like uh, soft spoken or whatever. I think, I, I can't remember how they described it, but like, or deferential or whatever. And they were circling around JFK being like, hey, yeah, we need to land. We're uh, running out of fuel. And JFK were like, yeah, okay, we'll get right back to you on that. We're landing planes here. You're in the queue. And they're like, and then they would be like, yeah, 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 we really need to land. Like, this is quite concerning. And JFK were like, yeah, 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 it's all good. It's all good. Just wait your turn. And then the plane falls out of the sky <laughs> because they were like, they know best. <laughs> they're the air traffic control. They know best. And they ran out of fuel and everyone died. Get out. I, I'm, I'm probably butchering that story, but uh, that's an incredible book. Black Box Thinking. It's one of my favorite nonfiction books. Bring your own blanket. This next entry is one which I have a little bit of personal experience. Whilst traveling from Florida to London, the exact same flight in which I wrote the Brain Blaze episode about United States United Kingdom differences, I decided to use the last hour of the flight to catch up on a little sleep. In order to facilitate this action, the airline had helpfully provided a small pillow and a blanket in a sealed cellophane packet. Upon removing these items from the packaging, which was presumably included to ensure passengers that the item was clean, I discovered a small crusty lump on the pillow. Being unable to easily identify this lump, I asked one of my travel companions what they thought it might be. After the pillow was passed around a little, it was decided that the unwelcome addition to my comfort item was in fact someone else's bogey. Oh, ah, how big was that, Dave? That's quite big. Impressive. I voiced my displeasure to a member of staff and was provided with a replacement, along with profuse apologies. Needless to say, I was no longer keen on the idea of using anything provided by an airline as a sleep aid. After I returned to my home and recovered from the combination of jet lag and a general feeling of unwellness which seems to affect me after every long-haul flight, I did a little bit of research on this and discovered that this was not the one-in-a-million occurrence that you might hope it would be. According to an article published on GoEveryCorner.com, all right. <laughs> That's our reference, is it, Dave? Blankets that are provided in a sealed cellophane wrapper are generally considered to be t untainted. However, this isn't a guarantee. Lab testing on sealed blankets from a popular airline revealed yeast, mold, and high counts of bacteria. No, I assumed it was in the cellophane. It's been to the dry cleaners. <laughs> that smells like ass. Furthermore, employees from a different airline who were responsible for laundering such items said that they had washed only about 20% of the blankets, which were the ones with distinct stains. The rest were repackaged for subsequent flights, and no disinfectants were used. If that's not disgusting enough, an investigation carried out by the Wall Street Journal discovered that several airlines only wash their blankets at best every five days and at worst every 30 days. That's disgusting. I don't like that at all. I don't like that. Those blankets have touched my face so much. Fucking disgusting. The only good thing that can be said about this is that both the articles, quite a few years out of date, we can only hope that this information being widely publicized has shamed airlines into more regular washing. <laughs> I hope so. Personally, I should be taking my own blanket next time I fly. Your pilot might be carrying a gun. I thought that's what like air marshals were for. Ever since the events of September the 11th, 2001, many additional security features have been put into place to help prevent future hijackings. In fact, we covered one such example of this at the beginning of the video. However, if a hijacker manages to make it past the martial arts trained eye gouging cabin crew, they may very well be met with a gun toting pilot if they manage to force their way into the cockpit. That's. You can't get in that cockpit, right? Those doors, like nowadays, they're f***ing sealed ass tight. Strangely, given that America pretty much hands out free guns at every sweet shop, any pilot wishing to attempt to defend their passengers or their aircraft from a hijacker must obtain a special license. According to UponArriving.com, the Federal Flight Deck Officers Program is run by the Federal Air Marshal Service, which is underneath the TSA DHS. It allows pilots, navigators, or flight engineers on passenger or cargo aircrafts to volunteer for special training that provides them with the authority to use a gun to carry a to carry and use a gun on a plane. What are you doing with it on a cargo aircraft? The cargo is getting a bit rowdy. Get back there, Jim. <laughs> Which, why? As far as I understand it, once the training is complete, it allows the volunteer pilots to be deputized as federal law enforcement officers. It's kind of dope, though. I'd do that. They'd be like, do I get a badge? I'd be like, yes. Against Hitler. FBI.
Interestingly, even after the right to carry a firearm has been bestowed upon a pilot, there are still very strict rules as to how, when, and where the weapon may be used. Obviously, it's not like, it's like, hey, Jim, what are you doing? I don't know, I'm just waving my gun about. Woo! Boo, boo, boo! Just, just, what are you doing, Jim? Just shooting some holes in the ceiling. Obviously, it must stay locked in a box. According to the information I found online, the pilot is only authorized to use or carry the weapon while in the cockpit, and it can only be used in the case of serious criminal or terroristic offenses. Yeah, I mean, the pilot's not coming back there to deal with, like, Rowdy Peter. Like, ch -ch -ch, sit the f down. No more wine for you, Peter. <laughs> While I guess it makes sense the pilots should not be able to stroll out of the cockpit but two shots in the head of somebody who's causing a scene because their food is cold or they found a bogey on their blanket, it does seem a little restrictive to limit the use of the gun to the cockpit only. If somebody kicks off and starts stabbing people while on their way to take over the plane, is the pilot or other flight crew member supposed to wait patiently until they arrive on the flight deck? Honestly, I think the answer is yes. I think the sensible answer is yes. Because... The pilots should not open that door. If someone's wielding a knife and they're stabbing passengers, the pilots should not, even if they've got a gun, do not open that door because it just risks the gun getting into the hands of that person and putting hundreds of lives in danger. I think that's perfectly sensible. Dave's criticizing that rule, but I think it should be, I think that's exactly how it should be, to be honest. Although, as I said, this does appear to be very restrictive, there may be a legitimate reason behind these stringent rules. Because the weapons are only authorized to be used on the flight deck and when the plane is in the air and must be kept unloaded in a special locked case when the plane is on the ground, it should allow for pilots to carry out life-saving duties when in countries other than the United States. I know this is a slightly off-topic thing, but I wondered about it, so maybe some of you did too. Is it as dangerous as people would have you believe to discharge a firearm on a traveling aircraft? Wait, did Mythbusters do something about this? I feel like they did, but I don't remember the answer. If the shooter somehow missed their target, could the bullet cause explosive decompression of the cabin? All this just reminds me of that terrible show that I actually watched the whole thing of. Have you guys seen Hijack on Apple? I was like, oh, it's made by Apple. It must be good. They make For All Mankind. They make The Morning Show. These are good shows. Hijack was awful. Like, more plot holes than I could ever imagine in any show ever. <laughs> Well, apparently not. According to Mike McBride, editor of Jane's Police and Security Equipment, even if regular bullets were used by Sky Marshals, the chances that a stray bullet would bring down the plane are minimal. People have got so het up about stray bullets passing through the shell of an aircraft, but people aren't going to be sucked out of a tiny 9mm hole made by a bullet. And aircraft have got loads of holes in them already, it's part of the design. Another couple of holes aren't going to make much difference. So there you go! You're probably much safer having armed personnel on board your plane, especially as, if Jack is to be believed, if something like 9-11 were to ever happen again and the hijacking was detected before the plane was crashed, it's highly likely that the aircraft would be destroyed before it could be weaponized. Planes get hit by lightning a lot. Although traveling in an airplane that gets hit by lightning might be some flyer's worst nightmare, it actually happens a lot and rarely results in a problem. According to an article in Time magazine, the last commercial flight that crashed as a direct result of a lightning strike was back in 1967, and technology has moved on a lot since then. All modern-day aircraft are specially designed with lightning strikes in mind. The outer shell acts like a Faraday cage, both keeping the people and equipment inside safe and allowing the current to pass along the aircraft to the tail, where it either returns to the clouds or jumps to the ground. Apparently, should the latter happen, passengers see a bright flash and hear a loud bang, but that's about it. To give you a rough idea as to just how common this is, the United States National Weather Service claims that any commercial plane in regular service will be hit by lightning once or twice a year. Whoa! I did a search online for first-hand horror stories from pilots who have been flying planes that were hit, and the best that I could come up with was a few stories that said that the planes experienced brief flickering of the cabin lights or very temporary sensor confusion, given that your average lightning strike contains 15 million volts of electricity. This does not seem unreasonable. One thing I did discover during my research was that as more and more planes are being built from a combination of both metal and composite parts, lightning strikes have to be dealt with in a slightly different way. For example, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, which is a fantastic plane. I've flown on one of these. It's really very comfortable and nice which is 50% composite by weight, has been built with an embedded layer of conductive fiber made from copper foil. This ensures that the electrical current from a lightning strike can travel unimpeded across the entire length of the aircraft. If these additional safety features were not included, then a strike would have the potential to do considerably more damage. Now, before we bring this episode to a close, I'd like to share with you the words of my father, who was once traveling from London to New Zealand when his plane was struck by lightning. Well, there you go. 
It's not that uncommon if Dave's dad, uh, if, if Dave's dad has had it. I was just watching the storm through the window and eating a biscuit when there was this almighty bang. I had to go to the toilet because I thought I'd hit my pants. <laughs> I hadn't. But judging by the suspicious smell that lingered in the cabin, several other people did. And that's where we end the episode. Thanks for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, everything is absolutely fine. There are no problems.